Hello and a very good evening. It's so great to have a full house at the LSE. Just amazing. Um, and uh, so a very warm welcome uh, to the LSE for this hybrid event. Uh, my name is Sumi Madhok, and I'm Professor of Political Theory and Gender Studies uh, here at the LSE, uh, and also the Head of Department of Gender Studies at the LSE. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> It's so great to see so many of you, uh, as I just said, uh, and a very warm welcome to our online audience and our audience here at the Sheikh Zayed Theatre, which is all of you. So a very warm welcome. It is my great pleasure and honour to introduce our public uh, lecturer uh, this evening and also to chair this um, lecture and a conversation um, and a book launch. Um, this evening's public lecturer, of course, needs no introduction uh, from me at all. You're all here because all of you know who they are. <laughs> the LSE events uh, pages uh, for this event appropriately describes them as a global icon, which indeed they are. <laughs> Judith Butler, sat on my, on my left. <laughs> is a philosopher and distinguished professor of the Graduate School and former Maxine Elliott Professor in the Department of Comparative Literature and the Program of Critical Theory at the University of California in Berkeley. They were the founding editor, uh, founding director of the Critical Theory Program and the International Consortium of Critical Theory Programs at UC Berkeley. Their books, including Gender Trouble and Bodies That Matter, have been translated into, wait for a minute, 20, over 25 languages. Uh, Judith Butler is active in gender and sexual politics, human rights, anti-war politics, and serves on the advisory board of Jewish Voices for Peace. This, week, uh, this evening's lecture and conversation, we've decided that it would be a little bit of, of both uh, this evening, uh, will launch, of course, their new book, Who's Afraid of Gender? Professor Butler will introduce their book and, you know, and in the first instance, speak for about 20 to 20 to 23 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> After which I will have, we'll have a little bit of a conversation uh, amongst ourselves. And then, and then uh, we will open uh, the floor to questions from you. For Twitter users, the hashtag for today's event is LSE Gender. Um, the event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast, subject to no technical difficulties. <laughs> as usual, there, as I said, there will, there will be this chance for you uh, to put your questions to Professor Butler for our online audience, because this is a, a, a hybrid event and it is live on LSC TV. You can submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the top left of your screens. Questions will be submitted to our events manager, Violet Fox, who is sat there right in front of me, and, and she will read out a selection of them for our in-person listeners. When you ask the question, please let us know your name and affiliation, and we are particularly keen uh, to hear from our students and alumni, so please do let us know who you are. Uh, for those of you here in the theater, I will let you know when we will open the floor for questions, and if you can raise your hands, and wait for the microphone. We have uh, rooming microphones. And I will then, at that point, also ask you to provide your name and affiliation before posing your question. Uh, and I will try, as chair, to ensure a range of questions from both our online audience and our audiences here in the theater. So uh, you would have already seen this as you came in uh, this evening. There will also be time for book sales and signing after the event if you'd like to take home a copy of Who's Afraid of Gender? But for now, I'm delighted to hand over to Professor Judith Butler. Great, thank you so much. I, I thought I would um, speak uh, somewhat informally this evening. Uh, can, can you hear me? Are the various microphones functioning OK? Um, excellent. Um, uh, so it was two, 2017, and I was part of a conference um, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, 
uh, on the future of democracy. And many of us from different parts of the world actually converged in Sao Paulo to discuss rising authoritarianism and challenges to democracy. And in advance of that meeting, I received some emails informing me that there was a campaign to keep me from entering the country and that there was also going to be a, uh, a demonstration against me in particular, um, or rather my name or whatever it was that my name represented to those who opposed me. And um, there was, it seemed, an improbable number of um, uh, people who signed this petition, and it was unclear whether there re really were that many people or whether some bot function was put into play to make it seem like the entire world <laughs> was opposed to my <laughs> coming to Brazil. Anyway, I arrived and I was whisked off the plane um, by the local authorities and taken under um, the airport uh, through various passageways um, and taken away in a car with a security guards and all the rest and I thought this is so improbable, what is the problem? <laughs> what have I said or what is it that I represent? Um, but they were concerned about my safety and indeed uh, I had a bodyguard with me the entire time. When I arrived at the event um, the following morning, a crowd had assembled and they had signs against me, which I didn't really understand, not because they were in Portuguese, but because they said things like uh, uh, no pedophilia. And um, I thought pedophilia, I don't think I've had an association with pedophilia that I know of. So I couldn't quite understand what that was. No ideology of gender, no gender. Um, I, I was alarmed, but I was protected and I had a lot of people with me and soon enough there was a counter demonstration. Wonderful people arrived outside and I could kind of watch this, but I couldn't go out there because my face was apparently incendiary in some sense. <laughs> so um, I stayed permanently in the green room <laughs> um, uh, watching this online or having people come in and show me photos. At one point, um, an effigy was burned of my image, or I guess it was my image. It was a kind of distorted image of my face. I had bright red eyes in a way that no human actually can have. Um, but I also had horns, um, <laughs> which is funny, and it is funny, it's improbable, um, but I, I recognized it as an anti-Semitic trope, right? <laughs> Jews have horns, all you have to do is look closely enough and you will find those horns. Um, I was also um, portrayed uh, in the effigy with um, a bikini top, which I thought was improbable. <laughs> um, but I didn't understand it because if they thought mm, that I should be uh, a natal woman and stay that way, um, or they were defending um, uh, sex assigned at birth as permanent and natural and inevitable, that if I were wearing a bikini top, that would be right. That would correspond to my um, my sex assignment, or at least the one they wanted me to have. So that was odd. So it, but it did seem to me that, that the bikini top was one way of acknowledging uh, a masculinity that they didn't really <laughs> want me to have. <laughs> so I was confused. But then I realized that it was kind of, mm, it had sequins on it and it was kind of a drag thing, right? So they were putting me in drag um, in whatever way that made sense to them. I'm, I'm still not altogether sure. <laughs> and then it burned. And I was inside this body. I wasn't burned. But that image was burned and I saw it go up in flames. And there were screams of joy because apparently the people who were burning it thought that they were 
taking the devil out of Brazil and that they would drive me out and that once I saw that burning that I would leave and they wanted nothing more than for me to leave. That it wasn't me, it was perhaps my name or what my name stood for. Um, oddly, I, I knew it wasn't me, <laughs> but it was my name. And um, I, um, I saw at that moment that um, I was figured as a demonic force and that the only way Brazil would be safe, according to these people, was if the demonic force that I represented was driven from the land. Um, I was reminded uh, by readers of Silvia Federici of the history of witch burning in uh, Brazil. And I thought, OK, this seems to be a, 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 uh, a noxious revival of that practice, at least in symbolic form. But it was the first time that I understood that there was an anti-gender ideology movement that actually figured gender as a diabolical force. And by diabolical, I mean seriously from the devil. And that my name was associated with it. Sometimes I was synonymous with it. Sometimes I was one of many names uh, um, associated with it. But then I had to be driven from the land because I was a demon, apparently a Jewish transvestite witch. It was complicated. <laughs> there was a potential alliance in that figure. <laughs> it was anti-feminist, it was anti-woman, it was anti-trans and tra travesti. Uh, it was, uh, uh, was anti-Semitic. It, it compounded a number of hatreds together. And I thought, OK, it's the image of me here, but what is this phantasm called gender that has collected so many fears and anxieties, which is understood as a diabolical force that needs to be driven from the land and needs to be expelled from public life, and whose voice or whose speech cannot be heard. So luckily, I uh, knew feminists working in that region and uh, conferred with other people afterwards who've been working for some time in Europe on the anti-gender ideology movement. And I quickly saw that there was amazing scholarship that had started yeah, back in the 90s, really, uh, tracking this movement, uh, the early declarations of the Vatican's Family Council in the 1990s, the declarations of Pope Benedict uh, against gender as an ideology and as uh, a threat to Christian doctrine, especially to natural law. But then also Pope Francis, who despite his occasionally progressive or better uh, proclamations, um, insisted that gender should be likened to Hitler Youth or indeed to an atomic bomb uh, bearing what he called the most, most destructive power in the world. And I thought, wow, people I know who work in gender studies or gender policy <laughs> or who are working on gender-based violence or are thinking about gender identity or gender identifications are not really all that powerful in the world. <laughs> um, they're struggling to get jobs or trying to get their arguments heard or you know, trying to get published or getting their legislation through or working with policies. You know, not, not the most powerful people in the world. <laughs> and actually very often kind of pacifist and I wouldn't say useless, but I wouldn't say. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I, I, I just wouldn't say that, oh, my God, they're taking over. You know? <laughs> I mean, we're defending our institutions. We're defending our programs. We're trying to defend our scholarship. We're, we're up against um, patriarchal 
and homophobic and transphobic enemies, and we um, we do the best we can under difficult circumstances. We're constantly at risk of being underfunded or defunded or captured by neoliberal metrics that don't understand what we're doing. And anyway, um, there was this notion that was so destructive, and I had to go a bit deeper into my research to understand that, of course, if God created male and female, and in fact, if God created the human as a dual structure, complementary and dual, there's male and female, they complement each other, the human always appears in one or the other form, the complementary structure of those two necessitates or prefigures heterosexual marriage and reproduction, okay, as the goal of sexuality, um, the purpose of, the higher purpose of sexuality. So in understanding that, um, and the Vatican did revise its views a couple of times to say it accepts certain kinds of feminism but not gender feminism, um, I also came to understand that um, the creationist uh, dimension of uh, the Vatican, but also evangelical and apostolic churches that came to adopt the anti-gender ideology, the creationism consisted in the idea that God creates male and female, and here come these gender ideologists, and what are they doing? They're saying they can create themselves, or they can change, or they can elect for a new sex assignment, or that you are to some degree, they don't say to some degree, I say to some degree, free to uh, pursue your life in a way that makes sense to you within the social, cultural, economic world in which you live. So the assault in their mind, it's not always the same in all regions, but the assault is against natural law, but natural law is understood as God's creation. So whatever it is that they thought social construction might be, um, they understood it to be a rival doctrine to divine creationism, right? God created male and female, and then these gender people come along with their social constructionist views and claim that we are able to decide or we are able to find our way or change our sex or give new meaning to what it is to be a woman or what it is to be a man or what it might be to be of another gender not contained by that binary, okay? So gender is a diabolical force because the devil is destroying uh, the doctrine of God's creation, God created male and female, and that if gender wins this fight between God and the devil, then um, uh, all kinds of um, demonic and sinful activities will follow. So one theologian, Joseph Scala, in Argentina published a book on gender ideology, I believe it's 2010, in which uh, he made the argument that if the taboo against homosexuality is broken, then other taboos will also be broken, bestiality will come about, pedophilia will come about, uh, sexuality will take any number of objects uh, uh, and um, that there will be no moral orientation and no moral restraint. In fact, he worried that gay marriage in particular, gay and lesbian marriage, would um, undermine church doctrine and produce a kind of Pandora's box of sexual licentiousness, which was paradoxical since Many, but not all, people who get married do seem, at least for a time, to have interests in monogamy. Um, sorry, this is my, my <laughs> effort. <laughs> I'm telling you this story because when they said pedophilia, and I thought, what? 
I didn't really understand, but I have did come to understand that the breaking of one taboo would, in the minds of those um, who were uh, constructing the phantasm of gender ideology, that it would unleash all kinds of sinful activities and that we would lose moral orientation and we would not be able to live a moral life. Um, but there was a second issue, obviously, which has to do with the centrality of the idea that children would be harmed by being taught about gender. And there are, there are basically two ways in which I have found that that takes place. One is to say that they will be seduced, either quite literally seduced, by those who are teaching gender. Um, or teaching about gender, or that they will find the idea of gender so seductive that they won't be able to control themselves, so they'll have to accept it. And that version of seduction comes close to the second version, which is indoctrination. People who teach gender indoctrinate. They, t they tell you what you must think. They tell you how you must think. You can only pass the class if you agree with them. Um, so we are gender studies people, or people who teach gender, or seek to at least include gender in the curriculum, uh, indoctrinating, which means that we ask people to pledge allegiance to this dogma, and we don't accept any criticism. Now, I don't know when the last time you were in a gender studies class. People argue all the time. <laughs> You know, when I was a kid, if you talked back in class, you were disciplined. Like, oh, Butler, she's talking back. I was, I was definitely she talking back. And, um, uh, and then um, I would be brought to the principal's office, and I would have to sit in a room by myself. Kind of like that green room, actually, come to think of it. <laughs> um, but, now, if they don't talk back, it's a failed class, right? If they're not talking back and saying, I have questions about what you just said, and why is that on the syllabus, and I don't agree, and I'm not writing about that, and that's not my topic, and you can't tell me what to write about, and you, by the way, you know, I didn't like your tone. <laughs> right? I mean, people talk back. They're, they fight. They don't agree. It's, it's loud. It's contentious. You don't have to line up and pledge allegiance to some ideology, but the idea that it's a form of indoctrination rather than a critical inquiry, and we're going to hold on to that word because I'm going to get mm -hmm. back to it really soon. Critical inquiry meaning what? We call into question the presuppositions <laughs> with which most disciplines start and we ask what's being suppressed, what's being excluded, what's being implied, where are the prejudices, what's how do we need to rethink them? That's the operation of critique, right? So we don't let people say to us that critique is simply negation. We, we, we reject that because critique is, since Marx, you know, even Marx reading the German idealist, Marx reading political economy, <laughs> we look into the presuppositions that have been taken for granted and we ask questions about them and we reorient our way of thinking and we ask what can be thought differently, what can be thought otherwise. And that's what critique is. Which means if I work on gender, I am critical. But you should call me gender critical. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I'm gonna wrap this up in a minute. What I, w I want to suggest to you is that the frenzy with which people burnt that effigy is something that I've seen or read about or heard about in several places in the world where something called gender, but also very often something called critical race theory, something called <coughs> ethnic studies, something even called migration studies, um, represents a threat of a grave kind. It will undermine society as we know it. It will undermine civilization. It will 
undermine the idea of the human, but also, and perhaps most centrally, the idea of the nation. And the, the right-wing Christians, and there were also left-wing Christians, and let's keep that in mind, that there have always been left, great left-wing Catholics and great left-wing Christians who don't agree, and there are gay and lesbian Catholic organizations that have done huge work changing people's minds and introducing um, caritas back into the discussion. Um, uh, but they're very often Christian nationalists. In other words, it's not just that they're defending Christian viewpoints or the Christian religion understood in a literal way or in a way that they've been taught, but they're also Christian nationalists. And for them, the family in its heteronormative form, what we would call heteronormative, is a natural form, and it's a natural form that serves the nation and the social reproduction of nationalism. So Victor Orban, for instance, will oppose miscegenation precisely because he wants the so-called natural family, which is always the national family, to reproduce the nation in a pure form. So we're seeing the reproduction of nationalism, the, the hostility towards migration, and the figuring of gender, either as a foreign element that must be expelled like a migrant, or as a form of um, uh, seduction or indoctrination. And the idea, of course, is that the children and the reproduction of the family are at stake. Um, both Giorgia Maloney in Italy and Vladimir Putin in Russia, within just a couple of weeks of each other, claimed that gender ideology will take your sex away um, or that you won't be able to be a mother or a father anymore or that you will, um, uh, your family will be destroyed. Okay. And I've spoken about this before, but I think we have to imagine that this threat that they see as um, affecting or threatening the nation and the family um, is one that they feel free to uh, destroy and to eliminate because of the threat it is imagined to pose. And there's something very tricky going on here. And I want to say that it is fundamental to what we might call fascist passions, which I talked about last month when I saw some of you. Um, but it just very, very briefly, by claiming that gender is so destructive and that it destroys the possibility of man, civilization, the family, the nation, whatever you need to do to destroy gender is justified, right? Because you're justified in destroying something that destroys what is most valuable to you. It's the language of war. It's the logic of war. But I think what we have to also see, and this will be the last point here in this section, is that gender does not just talk, does not just refer to gender identity, and it's the anti-gender movement is not just concerned with trans life, it is. Uh, certainly it's transphobic. It's also concerned with reproductive freedom, reproductive justice. It's anti-feminist. It is anti-gay and lesbian. It seeks to roll back gay le legislation that gives gay and lesbian people protection against violence or rights to marry or rights of free association and assembly. Um, and that we would be making a mistake if we thought uh, that the anti-gender movement in its global dimensions, and I'm not just talking about the local UK debate here, I'm actually trying to say <laughs> the local UK debate needs to be reconceptualized within this global framework, that gender brings a number of social movements together that have made enormous progress in the last years. And it's not 
it, it represents for the anti-gender um, ideology movement um, uh, a way of rethinking body, sexuality, freedom, equality, and it is not, and it's not just a matter of rolling back existing legislation. It is also an effort to restore an older order that looks a lot like the natural law that the Vatican wants to preserve, right? So distinct, a distinction based in natural law between male and female, which is then continued in the social distinction between men and women. And men and women are the only two possible options and they are complementary together. And without them being complementary, the human falls apart because mm -hmm. the human only exists in this complementary form. It is a duality, right? So if you get rid of that duality, you get rid of the human. Um, it is um, to the advantage of authoritarian regimes, and here we can name many of them, or emergent authoritarianism, and let's hold on to the idea that there might be new forms of authoritarianism that don't always fit the models that e have existed for prior forms. But one of the new forms that authoritarianism is taking is to foster panicked, fearful, exaggerated reactions to progressive social movements um, and making them appear as if they have the power to destroy all that is most valuable to people, their sexed identities, their family relations, their sexual relations, their understanding of themselves, it, it, their, sexual, their sexuality or their sexual orientation, um, and certainly their understanding of themselves as embodying and enacting natural law. So um, I do think that when we're talking about the phantasm of gender, we're, we're not talking about an academic topic exactly. Mm -hmm. We have a new topic to think about. <laughs> what is collected there? How many social movements mm -hmm. are collected under the term gender? How is this, phantas this phantasm uh, made? How is it circulated? What effects is it having? If it is a pervasively right-wing and even authoritarian movement, why is it that some feminists think that it's appropriate to be right. anti-gender? Well, I'm not saying they are fascists or they are authoritarians. I have not said that. I have asked why they would have arguments and produce arguments that ally them with authoritarian regimes that are stoking mm. fascist passions. And by fascist passions, I mean eliminationist ones, the ones that want to drive you from the earth or want to take your rights away or want to roll back rights in the name of restoring a heteronormative and patriarchal order that never really existed in the form that they dream. It's a bad dream, but there are chances to resist it, and I hope at least my book will um, make some steps in suggesting ways that we might take this on. Thank you for your patience. Okay. okay, so as I'd said before, um, this is the time when I'm, Jude and I are going to be in a, in, a, in a conversation, okay? So I'm going to, which basically means I'm going to ask you a question. Well, um, I might ask you, <laughs> I might ask you some questions. <laughs> so, okay, so, but let me just say uh, right, um, right, right at the outset that thank you so much for uh, laying out the context for the book's intervention, for, uh, you know, track, and in the book you do several things, actually, and I want to get to uh, a couple of them. Um, so in the book, you track the fearsome phantasm around gender across the globe. Uh, you look at its destructive and eliminationist impulses and the consequences on the ground, including tracking its colonial and racial legacies. And you also look at, and, and in some ways uh, towards the end, you were, you were talking about that, which is the weaponization of this fearsome phantasm of gender, particularly against vulnerable people across the globe. 
And, but here's the other thing. The, so that's one part of your book that you do, which is, which, is, you know, which, is, um, which is fantastic and significant. But there's another part which, which is um, equally fantastic and significant, if not more, which is you actually sort of say that, that this book is also about setting forth certain urgent tasks. And, and that's what I would like you uh, to speak a little bit more to us about today. So in the book, those of you who have already read the book, otherwise you will you know, get to see the book uh, at the end of uh, this evening's event. In the book, you say that you offer some arguments against anti-gender ideology movement, but really that is not the main or the primary aim of the book. And here I'm going to quote you a little bit. You say, and I quote, it is not possible to fully reconstruct the arguments used by anti-gender ideology movement because they do not hold themselves to standards of or, uh, consistency or coherence. They launch incendiary claims in order to defeat what they see as, anti as gender ideology or gender studies by any rhetorical means necessary. And so therefore, the task, and you alluded to that a little bit earlier, the task therefore for you is not simply to expose their ruse through more finely honed analytical skills or you know, which track their strategies of power and in order to prove them wrong. The task, on the other hand, is to help produce a world in which we can move and breathe and love without fear. Taking a stand against anti-gender movement is done in the name of breathing and living free from the fear of violence. It is the beginning of the ethical vision we now require. And this is what I want you to say a little bit more about the ethical vision that you've begun to sketch out in the book and really around three things in particular. One is uh, about the centrality of living an ethical life along with others, right? Uh, indifference, but, and, and so on, so that's one. The other one is the centering of critical inquiry. Centering of cri uh, critical inquiry uh, in the ethical life that we, are, uh, that we, should, uh, we should be building. And finally, the importance of coalition building. So this is not, these are not solitary tasks, these are not tasks that we do alone, but we do it in building solidaristic coalitions. So that's what I might Great. ask you. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, well, I mean, as, as for the first point, um, it, it would have been possible for me to simply write a book that showed that everything that the anti-gender ideology movement says is wrong, and I could prove that, and I could make a, um, I think, fairly persuasive academic argument and kind of stay in my place in the academic institutions and act, act as an academic and hold them to certain kinds of standards of rationality and consistency and evidence and just disprove it and leave it at, at that. The problem is that um, it's not an argument that's coming toward us. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't take the form of an argument. Sometimes it looks like an argument, but it shifts very quickly, and it's willing to shift. Mm -hmm. It's willing to say, this is libertarian, this is totalitarianism, this is hyper-capitalism, this is Marxism, this is um, indoctrinating the youth, this is um, uh, seducing the youth, um, uh, <laughs> and leading the youth away from church doctrine, but it's of course it's the church that's been seducing the youth and molesting the youth. <laughs> so you know there's a there's a kind of strange um, mm. kind of attribution to all of all the harms that the Vatican has in fact um, uh, uh, done um, to the forces that are challenging mm. the Vatican and. Um, or, or which they imagine to be rivals uh, to the Vatican. Um, but um, let me just say this. Uh, it became important for me to understand the phantasmatic dimension of what is being called gender because obviously they're not reading anything in gender studies. And even on the occasion when I would ask people, for instance, in Switzerland, a woman came up to me and said, "I." You know, I pray for you, and um, 
uh, you don't believe in the Bible and you don't believe in nature. And I said, well, actually, I do read the, she said, you don't read the Bible. I said, I do read the Bible. Actually, I took several courses in the Bible as literature. Uh, but she didn't like that. <laughs> but then when she talked, said I wasn't interested in nature, I said, well, you know, there's diversity in nature. And that didn't go over well either. <laughs> um, but I, I did, um, uh, I realized um, that these people are not actually reading anything. And they're against reading because if they were to read, they feared that they would be contaminated by what they read. It would seduce them or indoctrinate them. The power of these demonic words would have some effect on them. So they don't want to traffic with the devil, so they will not read. So it's not as if I could, and there are some theologians, uh, Marianne Glendon and others who do, who offer summaries for church authorities or have done so in the past, I should say, um, or who read some part of it in order to make uh, acad academic theological arguments. Um, but I think, um, uh, I, th I think that there is a, an anti-intellectualism yeah. and even an anger and resentment towards the academy, towards yeah. intellectual institutions and a deep distrust of them that this is the place where these improbable and dangerous ideas are, are circulated. So to be anti-gender is not just to be worried about several social movements like feminism or gay and lesbian uh, politics or trans politics. It's also to take up an anti-intellectual stand um, or sometimes to, uh, to let a certain uh, religious dogma uh, frame and form uh, one's own uh, intellectual position. Um, but the attack on universities and the attack on intellectualism is part of the anti-democratic impetus of this movement. It, it's not, they're not asking for open debate. They're not saying, I have some problems with your theory. I'm, I have some problems with your methodology. I have some problems with uh, the way you're teaching, let's, let's, let's have some sort of open discussion of what's actually happening, at which point you could say, well, I'm glad to tell you that you have an idea of how I'm teaching or what's happening in my classroom that doesn't correspond to the reality. And they could either accept that or reject that, and we would at least be in either a public debate or an academic debate, which allows for various sides to be articulated and people have to justify what they say and they have to bring some evidence to the fore and they have to have some logical consistency. This is not of interest. In fact, they're against it. They think it's all the, the work of some obscurantism that is destructive of um, what the values that are most important to them. So, um, so I had to do a different thing. I had to I couldn't just refute them, although I sometimes do. Uh, I had to actually give an account mm -hmm. of this phantasmatic structure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in a dream sequence, in the interpretation of dreams, Freud talks about the fact that there's a syntax to dreams that is very quite, this very strange. You have this dream, somebody you know is in the dream, some other strange person, there are these ac actions. But when you're interpreting the dream, you have to to figure out where am I and how am I distributed in this dream? How am I syntactically distributed in this dream? What is this figure doing? What is this? What are the, is the relationship between them? And after all, it's my dream, um, and it's an unconscious articulation of a certain kind. And I think Jean Laplanche um, made use of that idea of syntax to describe what he called the phantasmatic. And it's, it's not just an individual's fantasy or reverie. It's not just um, what I imagine to be true. It's, it's actually a staging of uh, fear and anxiety and desire um, uh, that has to actually be understood as syntactically orchestrated in different elements. So when Maloney wants to take the sexed rights of trans people away, the, the rights to identify and determine their own sex, the way she puts it is to say, 
that what they will do if they, if they get these rights is take our heteronormative natal sex assignment away. So what she's actually doing is what she's fearing will be done to her. And there's an inversion and there's a redistribution of destruction so that those who are destroying can say destruction is coming from over there. Now this happens not just in this particular scene, but in many scenes. And I think in the, the Catholic uh, objection to gender as harmful to children, we have to ask how the harm to children done by the church is being redistributed through a certain kind of syntactical arrangement so that it now seems to be coming from this thing called gender, right? So I, I had to think more along those terms mm. and also understand um, how the phantasmatic is articulated and um, circulated and why it has this contagious mm. effect, um, uh, especially during these times. Now, the only way to counter a phantasmatic mm. scene of this kind, it can't just be through argument. Mm. I mean, argument is important and I will always mm. be arguing. Um, uh, and we can't just be snobs and say, oh, these people are stupid, you know. <laughs> because then that, that's precisely the elite mm -hmm. um, structure of the academy against which they're railing. Um, we actually have to produce a counter imaginary that's more compelling than their phantasm of fear. Um, and the question of how to produce a counter imaginary, which is your question to me, mm -hmm. which I'm slowly getting to. <laughs> um, uh, is, 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 a, is a huge one because what kind of world are we asking them to live in? What, what fears and, and forms of destruction are, are we asking them to give up in order to come live with us in a different kind of world? And that's, that's not about defeating them, although we, we must sometimes simply <laughs> defeat them. <laughs> but it's to defeat, but also to compel in a way that they know how to compel. They compel with fear and anxiety and the prospect of destruction. Somebody says to you, they're going to take away your family. They're going to take away your sex identity. It's like, ah, who are these people? Let's drive them from the land. Um, how, do, how do we go about explaining what we do and the world we want to live in in such a way that it's compelling, that people want to desire to live in that world, so that we pull on desire and imagination in a different way that can rival and deflate the power of the phantasmatic. And it has to be at least partially through identifying sources of fear that are not about scapegoating gender or race or migrants or um, ethnicity or whatever it might be, but thinking about what, what are the reasons why so many of us do fear that our livelihoods are are going to be taken away, that our futures are, um, are non-existent, uh, uh, that we may well be, be harmed. Um, what, what forms of actual violation are there? What, what, how does climate catastrophe and war figure into, or hyper-capitalism truly, um, figure into our sense of what we fear? And what is the world that we want to build that would, um, allow people who are uh, uh, traditionally heteronormative or even traditionally religious with strong uh, uh, fears about gender and sexuality and new forms of family and kinship, what is it we need to say to them in order to cohabit on this earth and also uh, to work together to repair and uh, and repair the earth and make it sustainable, quite mm. frankly. Um, and I think that's an open question, but I have been thinking that we need, um, we need to engage art and media in new mm -hmm. ways, that the right is able to use media to propagate falsehood and hatred very, very quickly. Some people on the left do the same. Some feminists do the same. I, I think we need to find another practice. Mm -hmm. Less, less toxic, less destructive? Mm -hmm. Is there any way that a, a nonviolent <laughs> version of cohabitation and interdependency could be made to seem 
much more desirable and compelling than any uh, phantasmatic organization of fear and destruction of the kind that we're seeing in the anti-gender ideology movement. For me, it's an open question. It's something I, I want to ask people to think about. I can say <laughs> some things about what I think it should look mm -hmm. like. Um, but I at least want to open that question mm. as the way forward, because our arguments, no matter how good they are, are not going to be compelling unless we are able to frame them in terms of a, a vision or imagination of the world in which um, not just we want to live, but we want others to, to want to live as well. So I think appealing to desire, I'm, I'm wagering that appealing to desire is sometimes stronger than appealing to destruction. <laughs> Maybe we have desire and freedom on our side. We do. We do. <laughs> yes. um, okay, so um, 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 I think that is a good, I mean, I would like to press you on to think, you know, to tell us a little bit more about the intellectual and polit political resources for the, the sort of counter imaginaries that you've begun speaking about. But, you know, and, um, but this is all, I mean, if you'd like to, that's, that would be great. Uh -huh. Yeah, maybe two <laughs> minutes on that, and then we'll open it up to, um, to Q&A. Okay. What do you say? Or, yeah. Well, I mean, or we could open it to Q&A because it is a good point because you sort of said it's an open question, right, which you would like to ask uh, everyone. So it is an invitation yes. for, uh, to people to think along those lines and maybe we could take, we could sort of see what we've got yes. in terms of that invitation. Should we do that? We? Well, we can, but I also think, um, you know, just to go, go back mm -hmm. for a moment for the, to, to think about the deep anti-intellectualism mm -hmm. of this, yep. Um, right-wing movement. Um, I, I, th I think those of us in the academy have to move more in, into more public spaces yeah. to talk about why we do what we do and why it is important uh, more broadly. I think very often out of um, fear or academic motivation, we sequester ourselves and our work um, and gain recognition from each other in the academy rather than uh, trying to explain what we do more broadly. So I, I'm in favor of public thinking <laughs> and finding public spaces mm -hmm. for intellectual life to take place. Uh, I think that has to happen more so that there can be kind of open discussion of these matters. But I also think that environmental movements, radical mm -hmm. ecology, mm -hmm is putting forth an idea of interdependency among living creatures and living processes that we need to think about. We need to rethink the human-animal distinction and our deep interrelationships with, this, with, with other living creatures. Um, and, and, and put that forward mm -hmm. as part of what cohabitation means. And cohabitation and solidarity, it's not always loving, it's not always beautiful, it's not always harmonious. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important that you, I mean, Hannah Arendt said this in a way that I thought was uh, quite interesting, that even when you have deep desires to do harm to other people or even to do violence against them, um, you have to acknowledge that they have an equal right to cohabit the world. And that the mistake that the Nazis made in her view was that they thought they could decide who could inhabit the world and who could not. So even though she herself nursed some pretty strong hatreds for the Nazis, and understandably so, for the most part she thought they shouldn't be killed, except she was going to make an exception for Eichmann. I don't really know why. <laughs> Um, it always confused me because she had that general principle and then she thought, but that one, you know. Um, she had a whole book on it. Yeah, she did, she did. But I think there's something about being committed to cohabitation even when you want somebody to disappear from the earth. Like, what, what is that ethical struggle? It's like, you want this group or that person or some political party to be eradicated from the earth. Well, okay, you have that. 
what do you do with that desire for eradication? Mm -hmm. You actually temper it and qualify it with an absolute commitment to cohabit the earth. But we can only cohabit the earth, which Arendt did not see, if we have an earth to cohabit. <laughs> right. And she made a big mistake by forgetting about that earth, and she thought it was just a permanent condition of human relations, and it's not. It is imperiled, and it is precarious. So we have to fight for that earth, and we have to fight for cohabitation. And I think that also comes out in, in the idea of coalition and solidarity. We are mm -hmm. not always in solidarity with people we love, and sometimes we do not like them at all. But we would be very foolish not to be in solidarity when we have emergent authoritarianisms, when we have massive wars that are destroying uh, many lives and also toxifying the soil and destroying the infrastructures of life. We would be very, very foolish um, not to expand uh, our idea of solidarity uh, during these times because what the anti-gender ideology movement tells us is not, not just that it's like this group or th this group in Brazil or this group in Hungary or Italy. The anti-gender ideology movement is being espoused by major leaders of several nations in, you know, and they are in Europe and they are in South Korea and they are in Japan and Taiwan and they are in Uganda and Nigeria and they are in Brazil, Argentina, um, uh, 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 Mexico, not right now with this presidential election, but yes. Um, and this, this is part of uh, the most destructive kind of fa fascist passion stoking um, that we're seeing. And I, I think we need to understand that this is not just a local debate or an identitarian squabble. This is actually a question of democracy, of intellectual life, of open debate, and of, mm. of, of, and of the future of democracy, which is the whole reason I went to Brazil to begin with. Future of democracy. Yeah. Very much. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So much. Okay, so as I promised, there is. I'm going to open the floor uh, to questions from you. Um, I'm also going to uh, seek some questions from our online audience, which Violet Fox will will read them out. So I'll, I'll come to you, Violet, once I have a sense of uh, if I can see uh, questions in the theatre at this point of time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to collect a few questions. Uh, in the first instance. So if I see an indication of hands, then I will know how many uh, there are, and then I'll collect a few, and then I'll come to you, Violet, for one. Uh, on the okay, so um, I see a question here on the, in the second row. No, but I'm collecting them, so second row, uh, there's a question. Um, I see uh, I saw a couple of hands there. Yes, just on the, yes, on the right. But yes, I'll, I'll come to you. Uh, and then I see... Uh, and I see a question there. Yes, please. So, yes, your your hand, which is right up there. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So I have uh, three, and I'll take maybe one more. Yes, please. You, right in the middle. Yes, you. Right. <laughs> you know who you are. So, uh, yes. Yeah, so I have four questions, and then it's once so they're great. We can't do gender, right? That's the reason why we're 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 doing it like this. We are. <laughs> Because we so, can't assume, and it's right. It's right. It's right. It's right. Yes. It's right. We it's are, yes, we are. We are. We are sort of moving towards a space of cohabitation where we can all live uh, without such destructing each other. Yeah. So uh, I've got four questions, and then I will come to you, Violet, for one on one. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Hi, um, I'm Freya. And sorry, uh, yeah, and just, I wanted to also sort of say, please do say, you know, very briefly who you are. Remember, this is not an existential exercise, even though we are in the company of philosopher. So this is really, really briefly who you are, very quickly, and then, and please, please. I am Freya, and I'm in Lower Sixth. Um, and I was just wondering what you think about, so as these two sides become more and more polarized with, you know, obviously this kind of like alt-right movement against the institution of gender, I suppose, being incredibly well-financed and 
with Creoy creating this sense of moral panic, very widespread across, it's quite a basic thought, I think. Um, and then this other side of quite intellectual debate. I was wondering what you think about is trying to make this argument for equality and justice actually feasible, like trying to make it compelling, is that feasible at all with the kind of times of doom that we're in kind of with the climate crisis, with like neoliberal sense of individualism? Do you think that people will always choose this kind of easy option of um, believing what they're told and not really looking into it as they become more and more focused on the individual self? Hmm. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Chen Xia. I'm doing political theory. Um, so my question is, uh, you said that we need to create a counter imaginary. And so instead of just criticizing the anti-gender ideology, our priority should be to establish a positive ideal world that appeals to the desire of people. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, what kind of forms do you think is the most compelling uh, in creating this counter imaginary? So for example, John Rawls, he used theories and arguments to create ideal theory of what a just society should be like. And last time we talked about the role of poetry, I guess, and how the use of poetry can be very appealing to people and create a new, gen, uh, new imaginary. And just in general, what do you think of the role of arts in creating this counter and imaginary and what other forms can it take? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, hi, my name is Rosen. I'm a gender master student. Um, I guess I'm wondering, like, within this context of trying to, you know, again, build this, like, appeal of the new world, etc. like, what do we do in the meantime, I suppose, like, particularly as a community about, like, the, like, the, you know, the death of our community members and particularly, like, of, you know, you, I think people have probably seen various recent news stories that, are, you know, that I'm sort of specifically alluding to, but, you know, that, like, children and young people of our community are, like, being murdered. And, like, what, how, what do we do about that, I suppose, in the meantime? Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. And, yes, there was a question right there in the middle. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Vartika, and I used to study here. Um, I did gender, media, and culture. Um, and my question is about when you say later on in the book that um, gender as a term doesn't really travel or travels differently around the world. You have this line that says, the untranslatable may be another name for the desire that exceeds every effort, effort at lexical capture and normative control. And I'd love you to speak more on that if you'd like. Thank you. And can we have one online question, please, Violet? Yes, go ahead. So this question is from Lucia Qureshi, and you have to excuse me, uh, Lucia, if that was the incorrect pronunciation. They're a gender studies uh, master's student at UCL, and they thank you for the talk. And so they're interested in the discussion of anti-intellectualism and anti-establishment aspects of the fears and concerns about gender studies, and how academia and universities have been positioned as aligned with democratic values with how inaccessible higher education and academia is, and how associated it is with the global north in particular, Lucia was wondering if you could speak further to the ways to engage uh, groups that have been traditionally excluded from academia and gender studies specifically. Okay, thank you very much. So we have five questions. Um, should it? Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I, I don't know whether we're living in times of doom. Maybe we are. Um, if you say we are, then that's significant because it seems that way to you, or at least maybe that's a shared understanding you have with others. Um, but if we do think we're doomed, it's like perhaps we could we could think more about what are the what are the reasons for that doom, and one is obviously um, ecological catastrophe climate disaster, war, capitalism. 
violence done in the name of the nation state or nationalism, other violence as well. I mean, there are many things we can point to. And I think part of what is happening with the anti-gender ideology movement is that they're locating the cause of their fear of destruction or their sense of doom in the wrong place. So then the pedagogical question or the educative question we might say is how might we offer another version of the fear of destruction? Um, and here I think we also have to think about economic precarity and how many people are living without a firm sense of how they're going to make a living, whether they can keep their shelter, whether they will have um, a pension or a, uh, a retirement or what kind of safety net is still there. What kind of future is still there if you're young? Uh, I guess if you're old too. But I, I think that we can't just assume we're living in a time of doom. We actually have to make concerted efforts to say what is dooming us and what can be done to counter um, that kind of destruction. Because I do think it's probably a sense of um, the fragility of the world as we know it um, that we share across a great many political divisions. And it could ideally be one point on which we, we could achieve a different understanding which is why I think it's important to honor the fear of destruction that the right wing is feeling. In some ways, you have to, you have to talk to them right there in the midst of their fear and say maybe this is why you're fearful. Maybe, maybe there are some reasons for your fear that are not about gender or not about questions of critical race theory and the like. Um, but how would we do that? And we couldn't just do it inside the academy. We'd have to bring the academy out into the public to do that in a way that would be effective. Similarly, the idea of, say, John Rawls and an ideal of justice, which he, in fact, did through his counterfactual procedure, um, could that be popularized? I don't know. Could that be circulated as an ideal that people would um, quicken to <laughs> be excited about. I think we need to make our ideals um, sexy again, quite frankly, um, desirable. Uh, we need to appeal to the effective regions that the right is appealing to more effectively than we are, right? How do we make an emotional appeal, a passionate appeal? How do we make desire desirable? How do we make freedom desirable rather than frightening? I don't have a plan. I'm not a Leninist. I've never had a plan. <laughs> I don't think I'm talking about a new world. I don't think I'm talking about a future world that we can realize that has nothing to do with this one. I, I think I'm trying to tap into potentials of this world, right? So if we go back to ecological politics, for instance, and the idea of interdependency, or we go back to the idea of cohabitation as an ethical obligation, it seems to me that we see that. We see that in all kinds of new kinship formations. We see that in solidarity networks. We see it in um, uh, efforts to produce communities of care and solidarity networks dedicated to questions of care and reparation. Um, reparation is a huge term. It's there in so many social movements and it also belongs to ecological, environmental activism as well. Um, so I think it's a question of bringing out the potentials that we already have among us and making them in some ways more popular, more accessible, more desirable. And as much as I want to defend academic life and the role of the university, and I do do that, and I defend academic freedom and the importance of universities, I also think universities only flourish when they are porous when they serve the communities that are inside themselves, 
right? Or that they are to a certain extent driven by the questions that are posed by the communities that they are meant to serve. So that seems extremely important. So breaking down elitist structures and making education more affordable is clearly part of any answer we might give. I think it's important maybe to go back to that syntactical structure of the phantasmatic, that the people in Wyoming and Texas and Alabama right now who are seeking to deny or have, have succeeded in denying um, um, uh, gender affirmative health care to trans youth or to gender non-conforming youth, they are hurting those children. And they're hurting those children in the name of doing no harm to children. So ideally, when you have that kind of deep contradiction, like here are people who say they don't want to harm children. And they're harming children. They're depriving them of health care. They need to live to flourish. We need to have a larger consideration of what is harmful. We need to put out there what is harmful. In some ways, we need to steal back the language that they stole from us, right? Oh, you're talking about harm. Great, let's talk about harm, right? Using the doppelganger effect that Naomi Klein has taught us about to reverse it again, right? If Steve Bannon could take all of our language, even gender ideology is taken from Marxism. Ideology, really? Did you, did you read your Engels? Did you read your Althusser? <laughs> no, they didn't read their Engels or their Althusser, but they, they got the idea that you know totalitarianism is an ideology and it's not the same as, well, liberalism, but they don't really like liberalism either. So I don't sure who they're borrowing from, but they're borrowing and using as they wish, right? Producing confusion in the public, like, oh, where is the harm? Who's doing harm, you know? Where is the harm coming from? So doing harm to children in the name of saving children from harm, it, it's one thing to bust that open as a contradiction and expose it. It's another thing to have the broader discussion of what is harmful. So taking their language and expanding it so that, so that if they are truly committed to doing no harm to children, they will provide. They will provide and support gay affirmative or gender affirmative health care, sorry. Um, so I think um, they have all kinds of ideas about gender, uh, which include, in some cases, the Vatican has, has claimed that gender is a, is a colonizing effect of the global north. And that's a moment in which it seems that Pope Francis in particular is using a left argument to suggest that gender is a product of elite institutions in the global north and imposed on the south. Now, we all know there can be an imperialism of gender, that there can be an imperialism of human rights or uh, frameworks, that it is possible, for instance, in gender mainstreaming or the ways in which gender works in funding organizations to impose a language of gender on a culture that doesn't, where it doesn't really belong and where that's not the language that's spoken and where it's not actually capturing what the needs of that community is. And I think um, that the, the recent book by Leila Abulagod and um, Rima Hamami on gender violence um, suggesting that this very term is a kind of colonial administrative term that displaces from the actual violence that's being done in Palestine. That's important. We need to hear those arguments. We need to take them really seriously. But what the right wing is doing is suggesting that if it weren't for the colonizing influence of gender uh, on the global south, there would be men and women in happy heterosexual marriage, and that all gender diversity and all alternative vernaculars for gender are imposed <laughs> when in fact the binary of gender and the heteronormative idea of the family is an imposition of colonialism. So what they're really asking for is a return to the colonial organization of gender. So we need to be able to say that and show it, okay? 
because it sounds like, oh, wow, they're objecting to imperialism. Well, I'm going to be with the Vatican on this one. <laughs> but they're objecting to imperialism from the north and by, by, by defending colonial organizations of gender that suit the church's agenda. So that's an issue. So there are always these issues of translation. And we need to also take seriously the fact um, that the the colonial critique of gender as a term is an important form of study, and it's an extremely important, as Zetu Matebeni said here just a month ago, there are other ver vernaculars, there are other ways of referring to how you live your body in relationship to others that don't exactly conform to the English language gender. And it seems to me that gender studies as a field and the study of gender more broadly in any field has to be transnational and um, translinguistic, an argument I've uh, been making for some time and actually I believe made here a few years ago. Um, and that means struggling with the issue of translation and letting certain language go when it does not work and allowing the provincialism of English to be exposed. It cannot be the common language of feminism, gay, lesbian, trans life. In, if we have a monolingualism of English, then we are in fact, you know, uh, colonial or imperial in certain ways. We can't, as, we can't assume that Eng English is adequate to all the des descriptions we need. So upending or decentering English is certainly part of that. And if that means that we can't capture gender in any one language, then it means we can't capture gender in any one language. And if somebody says to you, well, tell me, what is it? Can you tell me what is a woman? How do you define it? <laughs> I think the only way to answer that question is to say that feminism begins with the critique of the various ways that women have already been defined and opens up the question what does it mean to be a woman? And keeps the question open for all time because we don't have the answers yet and there is no one answer. But the, methodologically speaking, keeping that question open is the job of a critical inquiry into gender. Right? <laughs> Global North. I think I did what I could do. Yeah. <laughs> and I think you 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 kind of folded in the question of anti-intellectualism, and so I think that's uh, that that's awesome. Okay. Answered. Okay. Right. So I'm going to now. I'm looking at the time. We have seven minutes. So I'm going to I'm going to look for another round of questions. Uh, wow. There are quite many hands, but I'm going to take four. Okay. Just so you know. So I'm just. So I've a question here. From Aicha. Uh, there's a question right there. Yes. Uh, right there in the middle, their hand was up. So that's two. Um, there's a question right at the corner with their hand there. Can you see? Three. And just so that I'll go to this side as well, I'll take the question there in the is it a light blue shirt with your hand up? Yes, sorry. Yes, your hand up there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, please. So we've got four questions. Um, and can we take them in that order? So starting from here. Yeah, yeah thank you. OK. Uh, hi, I Chuchu from LSE Human Rights and Sociology. Thank you very much for this fascinating conversation. Uh, thank you for pointing out to the fact that Arendt had the exceptions to her cohabitation, desire for cohabitation. I would like to ask you about your exceptions. Are there limits? Are there limits to the kind of solidarity uh, that we are asked to build? What are those limits and what kind of exceptions would you make? Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Hi, um, I'm B. I'm from the LSE Gender Department. I study gender research. I had to think about that for a second. Um, uh, I, my question is, like, in the context um, of this book and what you've spoken about today, um, what would you say, like, how can we better understand and interpret the recent, like, widespread negative reactions to um, the, the proliferation of like neo-genders and neo-pronouns, um, especially from within the trans community. Like I'm thinking of um, other members of my community who will kind of turn around and think about um, neo-pronouns as a threat to the kind of uh, acceptance level, uh, like the acceptability, sorry, of um, the trans community. And I'm kind of interested in what you would say about that. Um, thank you. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Grazia. Thank you very much for this um, presentation and conversation. Um, I wanted to ask you, in your analysis, you focus um, on the Vatican and on Christianity, and it's very clearly, um, like, very clear why. Um, I wanted to ask, what's the role of um, the other um, religions or, like, main monotheistic religions uh, in this anti-gender movement. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then there was just one last question. Um, hi, thanks. My name's Puck and I'm not affiliated with an institution. Um, so one thing I'm quite interested in is the increasing use, obviously, of like uh, the internet in terms of activism. Um, but more specifically, how I feel that quite a lot of activism is being kind of reduced to the sort of the level of language and words. And sort of the, what you just said about um, translation was quite interesting to me. So, for example, the word community is sort of being used uh, synonymously with identity markers increasingly, which seems quite often to sort of maybe reintroduce logics of nationalism. So what would you kind of propose in terms of ways to resist that? Thank you. Um, Judith, you have um, two minutes and 30 oh. seconds. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Um, <clears throat> well, obviously it's not possible to have solidarity with everyone, but if solidarity contains within itself a commitment to cohabitation of the kind that I'm trying to explain, then it also contains within itself a commitment to equality radical equality. And if people aren't going to make that commitment, then they're not welcome in, in, the, in the solidarity network. And, but it's not enough to say that. We actually have to cultivate that commitment. We have to show why equality is desirable again, because what is astonishing to me is how many people, despite claiming to be part of liberal democratic regimes, do not like equality and feel deeply threatened by it. So we have to we have to find a way of making equality desirable again, and we have to cultivate that commitment, but only with that commitment does solidarity actually work. Neo-gender, neo-pronouns, I'm afraid that's for your generation to figure out. <laughs> I mean, I will be interested to hear what you come up with, okay? So I always want to know, but there's no way I'm going to be an, ar an arbiter. Okay, but thank you for imagining that I could be. Um, I've talked a bit about the Vatican. I haven't talked enough about the evangelical church. I think there are, uh, there's, the, there's the Russian Orthodox Church. There's um, the effect of the Russian Orthodox Church, not just in Russia, but also in part in uh, Hungary in other forms of orthodoxy. Um, I think we have to um, uh, think about the apostolic churches in Africa and what they are also teaching and requiring. Um, and that's a very interesting situation because they are very often, in some countries, um, providing social services that governments can no longer provide. So they have, um, they have a, 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 an, an important I influence uh, on the ethics and values of um, the congregations. And when anti-gender and anti-gay, lesbian, and anti-trans rhetoric becomes essential to them, it's very hard to develop a consensus outside of it. I also uh, point out in the book um, 
what has happened with Confucianism, which is always very interesting and contested. Uh, in Taiwan in particular, there are apocalyptic forms of Confucianism that uh, are involved in combating the idea of gender. But let's also remember that there are secular traditions that are combating the idea of gender. Most um, uh, trans-exclusionary feminists uh, are positivists who claim that a fact is a fact is a fact, that it can be determined, and it's simply there, sort of ignoring the philosophy of science and the history of science that says that the framework with which you use to describe what you observe participates in and partially constructs the, observ the observed item itself. Okay, we can go further into that another time, but I think there is a recourse to positivism and um, a kind of uh, 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 co common sense that um, refuses uh, to consider the framework within, within which facts are established as such. It hardly matters that the scientific material on sex uh, determination refutes the positivist recourse to science because when it does, it is, it, is, it is just treated as a scandalous publication in a scientific journal. Okay, we're, I'm not gonna go further into that. Um, the internet, really rough. We need, <laughs> it's not, not kind. Um, language and words are important. They're not everything, but they're hugely important. And sometimes what you're calling an identity marker is a way of saying to somebody, if you want to recognize me, this is the way I want you to do so. And you have a choice at that moment. You could say, no, I'm not gonna recognize you in the way that you, you want me to. I'm gonna recognize you according to classificatory schemes that are most familiar to me and I don't wanna budge from my classificatory scheme. Then you're facing that person and you're not gonna have a very good relationship because you've refused the petition, the address, the request. I think we do need to learn to listen to one another and also adjust our language, even if it means stumbling, stumbling and erring, as I often do. Um, I think we have to put our best efforts forward to understand what people are saying about the conditions under which they understand themselves to be respected and recognized. I don't think identity markers are, ne ne are necessarily nationalistic. There are nationalistic identity markers for sure but let's distinguish among them because there's also anti-nationalist identity markers. <laughs> so identity itself is not the problem, but I do think that people are trying to avoid effacement and to gain recognition <coughs> and to at least produce in local communities or provisional communities the kind of world they wanna live in where they do feel like they have place and recognition. And given the doomsday issue, sometimes we only can negotiate those places with each other in these more local environments. And maybe we should read that for what it is, as a desire to belong, to be seen, to be heard, not to be effaced. It's a big struggle these days not to be effaced. I think people who find their way in language to resist effacement are, are to be respected, since we don't wanna be on the side of effacement. I don't think we should. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Butler, for answering the questions from the audience um, and really setting, setting out the urgent tasks and the counter-imaginaries that we have, uh, that we need to kind of get on with, basically, uh, including, um, you know, including sort of the importance of cohabiting the planet together uh, and expanding, radically expanding ideas of solidarity, coalition building, and commitment to equality, to radical equality. So I thank you uh, for very much for those. Thank you very much also for those of, uh, for those of you who've joined us online. 
uh, and, and, uh, and with this, with my thank yous to everyone in the room, so thank you so much. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'd just like to thank you, Sumi, and the Gender Institute and my pals at LSE and who, with, for whom I have such great respect. It's, this is a perfect place for me to make a launch, and I thank you enormously. Yes, so thank you. <laughs>